but uh, yeah, so uh, this is actually going to be an introductory talk about, about React uh, Native. And uh, first of all, you can't actually talk about React Native without talking about React. So uh, React is a, it's basically a JavaScript library for building UI. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to tell you a story to just kind of give you an idea of, of what this means. So I've been uh, sort of like uh, binge watching Heroes on Netflix for like the last couple of weeks. And I thought I'd seen the whole series, but apparently I got stuck somewhere to save the cheerleader, save the world. <laughs> so I went back and I've been watching a lot of it. And because it's sort of been on my mind, I was going to use this story. So there's my favorite character. His name is Hero. He's, um, he's got this special gift. He can teleport through time, through space. And he's a really cool hero. So whenever he does it, he goes through, at least from what I've seen, he goes through this process. Uh, super awesome drawing. So he usually just, um, he's somewhere. And then when he wants to teleport, he just gets into this sort of like zone where he concentrates really hard. And then he may find himself in a new place, maybe, maybe not. And then when he does, he just gives this kind of like huge cry, like, I did it. So it's, it's, it's always cool to watch because he's just such a happy character. And so I wanted to say, use this as an example of, let's say I wanted to actually create something which says, hero, go teleport. What would it look like sort of in some kind of random JavaScript code? It might look something like this, where there are certain states representing each, uh, each particular part. And for each, uh, we're going to transition through each state. We might have something like a teleport state, which starts off in sort of like a begin. And then we loop around, and we wait sort of one frame between. So the first thing is, and we'll wait until he's done. The first stage may be that uh, he first sees if, uh, if he's actually, go back one, one thing, if he first finds out that he needs to begin, he's going to sort of go into his concentrate mode. And you can think about it in the background. This is probably manipulating if it's a web app, some DOM. And then the next stage, if he is now in the next stage, which is uh, it's in progress, then at that point, he's going to open his eyes and sort of like see um, what's going on and where am I. And in the next stage, he might go in and check where he is now. At this point, we're going to sort of some random thing that says, what is the current scene? And if it looks like he's in a new place, then he's successfully teleported. And he's going to kind of lift his hands up and give a shout of victory. So you can see that it's almost like we're using all these uh, state to kind of transition through and perhaps manipulating the DOM. So this is what it would look like. And we like to think of this as sort of like imperative way of programming, where you're just giving a set of instructions line after line and doing things. So the difference with React is it kind of introduces a different paradigm where uh, you're describing your application. And it's like a UI centric. And it's a view is, is a based on the state. So you can actually, based on the state, figure out what it's going to look like. And it's a little different. So if we take, again, a little uh, hero called hero. So he might actually, you can think of them as different parts. Instead of transitioning um, by state, you can say, what does hero look like when he's actually concentrating? So the only part that you can see that changes is perhaps his kind of eyes are open or closed. So if it's teleporting, his eyes are going to be closed. Otherwise, it's going to be open. And you can just look at this. Don't worry about the language right now. We're going <laughs> to explain it in a little bit. On the other hand, if he's now in sort of another stage where he has successfully uh, teleported, his hands are going to go up. So it's almost like if you're thinking about it, it's a little different. So you're just describing the, the UI based on certain states. So are you teleporting or are you not teleporting? Was it te are you in a teleport success state or are you not? And if you look at, if we rearrange this code a little differently, so we just have this state, whether or not you're teleporting or whether or not teleport is successful, and uh, you can set it up using some of the different states. But at the end of the day, what you have is this UI, which is basically a class. Um, if you think about it, uh, again, we're going to go in, into a little bit more detail. But it's made out of, say, maybe a div class, which is here, which is sort of like the background image of him. But then you have two things. It's, it's what's, what's changing? Is, are his eyes open? Or what, what does his hands look like? And that's basically, when you look at it, it's a little easier to just look at the UI and kind of know what's going on. So. That's actually what uh, uh, React is, is, is. We want to think about it. And UI, in, in React world, a UI is composed of something called components. So the basic building block of a React is a component. And you use those building blocks to compose your app. 
And I'm going to show you one particular example, sort of like a hello message component. So this is a class, and it's uh, if you look at the syntax, it's um, every component implements a render which actually composes the UI. And it's got this XML-like syntax, which the first time people see it just kind of like throws them off, and they're like, this is just terrible. But it's JSX, and you're wondering, why do you have mock-up all over my, my code? But this example, um, once you kind of get used to it, uh, you'll find that it's a little, it's actually easier, easier to use, but it just takes a little get, getting used to. So in this particular component called a hello message, a div is being returned, and it's being returned based on something that's being passed in called a this.props, so in this case, a name, and then it's gonna print it out. And a component not only can have properties passed into it, but it can have also its own internal state, which can be accessed via this.state. And when you want to add a component to kind of get it to show up, say, on the web app, you would do something, if it's a web app, like a react dom dot render, and then you pass in the component. And at the end of the day, you also pass in where do you want it to be mounted. It could be like a DOM mode. So this is how you would typically say, just have a, a React code uh, just show up on the screen. But behind the scene, what's happening is that the React framework is, is going in and it's actually taking this weird looking syntax, it's transpiling it using a, a JSX size file, like say Babel, and then it's gonna throw out something that, that the browser can understand. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about state versus props. I said before that a component can have state, and um, it's usually created within the component, and it's something that only the component cares about. It's, uh, you can actually read the state using this dot state. In this example, we have a comment list component, and there is one comment which is, uh, uh, um, so there's this, like the state of like say the comments, maybe it grabbed the comments from uh, a server somewhere. You can also um, uh, mutate the state. So you, in this case, if you wanted to mutate the state, you would just do a this dot set state, and that's how you would handle states. On the other hand, we have something called props. So in this example, we have a comment list, and a comment list can actually call another component, which is a comment, and it can pass information into this comment, and this could be a prop. Now, the difference is the props are immutable. Uh, you can actually set a default within the, um, within the actual component, but, and you can also check and validate to see if it's the proper type, but other than that, you cannot change a prop within a uh, component. Uh, so the other thing I'm gonna talk about like three features that React gives you. And one of the key features is, it'll kind of give you an insight into another thing that makes uh, React pretty cool. There's something called a virtual DOM. So when, uh, what React framework does in the background is there's actually, for, you can think of if it's a web app, there's actually the DOM that's in the browser. There is a virtual DOM that's actually running like in, in, in memory in JavaScript. And when you are actually sending commands to it, the virtual DOM is gonna look at the current state or the current prop, compare it to say what's happening next, and then make only the changes that are necessary to get it into the next state. So if you go through the flow, typically you will have uh, a view which represents some, some state. And then after that, maybe the user may interact with it. And at that point, it's gonna change the state or the prop and then it's gonna cycle through, the virtual DOM's gonna figure out what is the minimum set of changes it needs to uh, implement the next set of views. It makes this really performant in terms of, say, the UI just acts a little bit faster. So that's another one thing that uh, React has. Another thing that uh, React components have is it's composable. So if you look at this example again, you've got a comment <coughs> that, that can have multiple comments in it, and each comment uh, information might be passed from the parent comment list, but each of them is sort of self-contained with everything that it needs to do to uh, know to run it. So uh, this comment versus that comment, each of them are very well self-contained. Another feature that uh, React actually likes to propose is sort of like a one-way uh, data flow. So kind of different from traditional where you have like two-way binding. With React, we like to think that sort of all, all data flows in one way. So again, to the example of a common list, it may pass to its child components information through all these different props. So an example, also you'll actually have maybe a comment may have like another component in it, which is just say, for example, something that demonstrates a like, and it again gets passed in. And say maybe somebody clicked on the like and say, so now how are you gonna actually update that? Well, the way we typically want it to get done is you might set up sort of like an event callback, which goes back to 
the parent and then make that change and then sort of data flows one way. It's a lot easier, for example, now in this particular paradigm to figure out where is state changing. For, for some of the other ways of doing, say, JavaScript, you might just get confused who changed the data. So this is actually a much, much easier way to kind of reason about what's going on. So that's kind of like a, a very, very quick walkthrough um, of what React is. And uh, there's obviously a lot of documentation that you can go and get started. So React was open sourced uh, a few years ago and it's uh, been and doing pretty well. And then earlier this year, we actually open sourced uh, React for uh, iOS and within the last couple of months, React for Android. So that's what I'm gonna talk about next. So what is React Native? React Native is basically a framework for building a native apps, emphasis <coughs> on native using React. So previously you saw that the virtual DOM may actually send information and it might be a browser a DOM but it doesn't have to be, and so that's where React Native comes, up, comes in. And uh, just to step back and just kind of give you a case for why we actually ended up uh, working on uh, React Native. React actually itself was built out of a necessity from the ads engineering team that needed to work with large scale data. And the same, uh, same team actually kind of spearheaded what was done with the React Native. So there's two actually issues that we have at Facebook that we were trying to solve. Number one is that Native is just like an inherent uh, better experience. So when you're actually doing, whether it's in your iPhone or Android, scrolling, touch handling, gestures, just feel a lot nicer if it's a native experience versus say if it's something that's like wrapped in a web view. Um, so that's one thing that you want to keep when, we are, when we're developing apps for, our, uh, for people who are using Facebook apps. But on the other hand, so that's actually key and we really want to keep that. And sometimes, um, at least in our history, that kind of went against Another thing that we care about is developer experience and how we can move fast and actually create these apps. So on the flip side, with developer experience, we wanted to uh, see what we can do to just increase the speed at which engineers at Facebook were, were working in uh, kind of creating apps. And so for that, what React Native on React and React Native brings to the table is just trying to put some of the best and say web development experience and bring it to mobile development. And that's what React was trying to solve and I'll show you a few things. But I also want to tell you a story of sort of some of the things that we did. So this is the mobile ads manager project, um, app. And on your left hand side is the iOS version of the app and on the right hand side is the Android version of the app. So we actually had ads engineers who were web uh, developers, not iOS or Android, build these two versions. And when they built the iOS version first and uh, kind of went <coughs> through it, they took the same they, they took the same, the same folks actually turned around the same team and built the Android version in about three months. We we're using about 85% of the code. If you look at the pieces in the middle, which is like the, the list view and the business logic, those are most of the pieces that were, re, were reused. But things that were very specific to iOS or Android, such as navigation, those were made uh, separate. But this was actually a huge win because the folks who worked on this project, they were not iOS or Android engineers. These were ads engineers and they knew exactly how they wanted to build the product. So we, uh, we found that this is a great win and we've open sourced both React and Re React Native. As I said, 85% of the code was shared. And going back to the example of the virtual DOM, when we have, uh, before I showed you like a hello message with a div, when you're working with say uh, iOS, you would be <coughs> using things such as views. And in this case, if you would map into a UI view or a text or an image likewise into the UI kit equivalent, and that's how things would map. So this is why it's actually a native app. It's not actually JavaScript running. Similarly, for Android, a view would map into, say, a, a new frame layout and a, a text uh, into a text view and an image into an image view. And that's how we get the native experience. And so what we've learned out of all of this is that the idea behind React Native is that you're going to learn to code the React way. And once you learn how to do it that way, you can use those skills to develop on any uh, platform. So let's go ahead and uh, show you how you can actually get set up and running with React Native. So first thing we want to do is there's some requirements that you have to install, and these include things like Homebrew and Node.js. Once you've got that up and running, if you're developing for iOS or Android, you would then set up the environments that you need as an iOS developer, such as Xcode, and in Android, you need the Android SDK and a few other things. And then the next thing is to just install the uh, React CLI, it's an uh, NPM package. You just bring that down and install it globally. 
And then after that, you sort of get, you're now ready to uh, uh, set up with React. And in this case, you just ran, run a CLI command, React Native, init, and then the name of your app, and then so you're good to go. So let's go ahead and actually go through a demo and just uh, show you how a few things are, are working here. So here I have internal, and it is, let me not mirror the screen. I need to make sure it goes, it shows in the. So what you see is, uh, in here is, is a terminal where I actually, just for the sake of time, I actually had run a, a React uh, native init. So I had previously just run the command to initialize my React native app. And what it did is pulled in all of the NPM packages that were needed. It created all the template files. And then it kind of gave me instructions at the end. If you want to run your app in iOS, do this. If you want to run an Android, um, do that. So I'm going to show you what it looks like uh, when it gets set up. So once you've got it set up, on, uh, you just open up Xcode. And within Xcode, you can just basically run the project. And when you do, I'm going to just go ahead and kind of get the project running. Actually, it's going to say. So what happens is it actually then runs a uh, so what's happening here is it's actually starting a Node.js uh, server and it's running a package script. It's packaging all of the code that's related to this project and I'm gonna show you the code and then it's uh, running it here. And then we have this, uh, so you can see in the simulator it's up and running. Welcome to React Native. And the same thing can be done from Android. So actually I could run the, Uh, minimize that. So from Android, actually, I, I can run the same thing and get it set up and running. I've got, uh, in the case of Android, I have an emulator up and running. And it's actually the same code running, um, React Native Welcome, and it's got different files. Let's look at the code to see what we've got set up. I have a code running. So here's uh, the code that we're looking at, sort of like the hello, a world that just gets you up and running. And you see here it says, welcome to React Native. And I can actually change this and just add something, say uh, iOS. And then if I look at uh, here, I could actually do uh, command R and then it's basically, I have it all running. It's a much easier experience than say when you're doing a traditional iOS program where, where you have to kind of rebuild things. And the other thing that I can do is I can uh, also enable live reload so that anytime I make a change, so long as I just hit save on my IDE or uh, Sublime, whatever you use, it's gonna instantly uh, uh, show up over there. Same thing with the Android one. I can also go to this particular file, which is the index.android.js and make a change. <coughs> and then if I go back to my, uh, to the, to my uh, simulator, and just uh, refresh it, I'll be able to see the latest change. So it says, uh, it adds this thing. So it makes it much easier to, uh, <coughs> to do native uh, development this way. So uh, uh, just to kind of quickly say what's going on here, when we, this code that is running in here, it actually produces a, a bundle file, and this bundle file is transpiled, and it then gets generated into all these JavaScript objects, which then can get run on the, uh, the browser, so the React framework does all the magic with the virtual DOM, et cetera, and then spits out the views as, as necessary. So I'm gonna quickly go back to my presentation, just give you an idea of some of the different things that uh, we 
So um, whenever, so what's happening in the background is we each, whether it's iOS or Android, it shifts to the JavaScript uh, exec uh, executor. And what the JavaScript executor does is it depends on JavaScript core, which runs on, I there's one for iOS and one for Android. And there's a bridge in between that uh, pushes commands back and forth. So you can make JavaScript calls into native and also you can, uh, the native can expose all these UI kit and all these frameworks back to the JavaScript code. And the other cool thing is the method calls are all serialized as they go through the bridge. And then communication is batched and is async, and that makes it performant. So there's some things that uh, run on background threads, so all of the JavaScript code runs on background threads. If you have any special modules, that also runs on the background threads. But anything, say, UI kit related or UI, that runs on the main thread. But what this all means is that it actually is pretty performant, so things such as scrolling can happen a lot more smoothly smoothly because it's not being blocked by any sort of long running threads. So that's what's going on. So uh, with that in mind, let's actually have a little bit more fun and let's cr create an app. So what I'm gonna create is I'm gonna create an app. I was thinking about this last Thursday and I said, you know what, I've never actually played around with the Instagram API. So let's see if we can create uh, kind of like a pseudo Instagram app and take in some of the key pieces. And this will just kind of give you a flair for what it means to develop within <coughs> React Native. So the first thing I did is I went to Instagram and I signed up for a developer account and then grabbed an access token and decided I was gonna use this API, which uh, allows me to get my feed. And I'm like, okay, what does that look like? So I, I decided to, okay, let's make this smaller. So this is kind of like a snapshot of the feed I was looking at. And then I'm like, okay, well, what does the data look like? So I used Postman to get me sort of a snapshot of the data that's gonna come back with. I'm like, okay, this looks pretty cool. Let me go ahead and use this to uh, create an app. So first things first, I just took a snapshot of that data, so all of this JSON data, and just for the purposes of uh, expediency, I saved that on a local file so that I can uh, make, make changes and pull the data. So that's actually what the setup is, and um, now let's go back to our, uh, our IDE, our new client, and let's go start it like making changes. And I'm gonna make changes on iOS and just uh, watch it live reload. So. Right. so here's our iOS app, and the first thing I wanna do is let me just kinda get an idea of what I wanna do. I wanna have a list, and in this list, list I'm gonna show all this data, but just to kinda get, Started, let's, uh, let's add, say, just the username for the Instagram for each one of these photos. And I'm gonna change things in here. First thing I'm gonna do is, uh, is the React provides some components out of the box, and one of them is called a list view component that allows you to make, uh, to create a list. So uh, let me go ahead and, actually I, actually, I, I like using the ESS, ES 2015 syntax, so I'm just gonna switch to that. There's different ways that you can actually create this, and I'm just gonna use that syntax. And then we'll just add a constructor. So this is a, a way that I can use JS syntax, and this is the component, which is sort of like the entry to my app. And it has a render function, which at this point is just showing some views, and I'm just gonna change this. So as I save this, let me just make sure I didn't break anything uh, by switching to uh, AS syntax. So all that, that looks good. So now let me add the list view. So, so to add the list view, there's a couple of things. I'm gonna use a, a list view component, and uh, so what I just dropped in here is I dropped in a list view component and a list view component, one of the things that you can pass in is information about if a row has changed. And if a row has changed, you, just, uh, you can pass in a function that tells you whether or not a, a row has changed. And here's an example of how you can use state within a particular component. So I'm gonna be cloning, I'm gonna create a data source for my list view and I'm just gonna use it uh, test data. So earlier I said that I had actually saved a copy of the, uh, 
a call and let me actually bring that test data. So whenever you're using React, you can generally bring in any of the JavaScript files using a, a require statement. So here, I'm just the same test data that I used here, I actually had previously saved it into like sort of a key snapshot JS. I just uh, exported all of the data that I had. So now the next thing I want to do is I have set up my data source, but now I actually need to render it. So to render it, I'm just going to go in here and I'm going to uh, just, uh, in, instead of a view and a text and all this, I'm actually going to have a list view. So. So here I just uh, change the view here. So here I have a list view. The data store comes from the state. And then I have this function here. So what is this strange thing? So actually, the renderer can be a function that returns another component that you're going to render for each particular row. And let's just define that. And I'm going to do that here. So this function here, this dRender row, takes in the row data. It gets a section ID, and it gets a row ID. A row ID, and then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take for each particular <coughs> row, it's going to be basically some item from Instagram. I'm going to take in the user, and I'm actually going to take in the username, and I'm just going to display that. And then the last thing I want to do is in here, I actually have to let React. I have to add this to a, a list of <coughs> users so that you can. This, this is called like a destructuring command. So instead of having to always type say. React.list view. If I do it this way, I just need to type list view. So here I've got it set up. I've got my data source. I've got what's being rendered each row, and um, I should be good to go. Let me let me save this and see what happens. So as you see now, we've got like if you can barely see it, but this at the top there is these all of the different usernames, and it's kind of like looks a little weird because it's all bunched up in the top. So I'm gonna add something that I'm then gonna explain uh, shortly. And at this point, you're asking, what on earth am I doing? But I've actually added some space at the top. And so that's kind of bringing you into sort of the next topic, which another thing that React does in terms of sort of like violating a lot of, I mean, separation of concerns. Now I've actually even added styles that just made things a lot worse. And you're wondering, <laughs> what on earth is going on? So um, let's talk about inline styles. So there's something called Flexbox that's uh, there in the, web, uh, in the web world that allows you to do CSS very uh, nicely and allows you to do things like have margin and tops and uh, all these different things. You can very easily set up things uh, against a row. So in this example, you have something that is probably going to be a list item in a row and you've got an image, you've got a title, and you've got, say, some summary text. And you can add styles in here. And these are all JavaScript objects, so a style could uh, have something called, uh, uh, you could set up data so that things flow in a certain direction. So in this case, whenever you have a view and you put things inside of the view, by default, everything flows top to down. But if you had, if you had something like a flex direction, then you're saying that I want, I want things to flow in this direction in a, in a row. And there are other things that you can do to sort of center your text. A lot of information here. And we took, actually, we open sourced a CSS layout tool uh, the CSS layout library that we made work in Objective-C and in Java, and that's what we're using within React Native to say if something, somebody brings in something flex direction, this is what it's gonna look like. And believe me, if you've actually worked with iOS and anything like auto layout, et cetera, this is actually a lot <coughs> easier and nicer to actually position your elements. So when I added the margin top 44, what I did is I just added a style which said, I want everything in the view to come down by 44. So that's kind of like a quick intro to, uh, to uh, CSS styles. And so coming back to my project, to our project, we're going to do a, a, a few other fun things. Because now all we have is this boring user name. And we want to sort of add some other things. We want to add, for example, kind of like a profile picture. So I'm going to go here. And so what did I just do? So I actually, before I was just returning a text related to the username. But now what I'm doing is I'm adding an image. And so the image I'm adding, uh, there's another image tag in here. And again, in the JSON, it's exposed under something called a profile picture. 
And because it's an image actually that lives on the web, uh, I need to actually give it a width and a height, and that's what I've done right here. And so with this, I should be able to now grab the image and let's see what happens. And we've got this sort of red screen of, of death. I've done something wrong. <laughs> so what have I done wrong? Another thing that React actually does that's really good is it tells you very clearly what you're missing here. So it says you're trying to render a global image variable as a React element. You probably forgot to require the image. And yes, I did, and I always do forget to do that. So here I have to go back here, and if I add the image in the require, and I refresh it, now suddenly I have the image showing up here. Um, but I actually want it nice and rounded. So what are some of the things that I can do? And this is kind of be like a, a lesson more in other things that you can do with style. So in this image, uh, let me add something called a border radius. So border radius is a way to, and I'm going to make it 25. And again, if I save it, then suddenly everything is nice and round. It was very easy to do that. It would be a lot harder to do that with the iOS. And the next thing I want to do is I don't want things to sort of flow top to bottom. I want it to flow in a row. So I'm going to add style sheets, um, style information here, and then apply it to this view to say everything under this view, I want it to flow in a row fashion. And so here, we actually had other, I don't need to welcome an instruction. This came with a default project. I'm also going to make a few changes here and make the background white. And then uh, I'm just then going to add for a So here I'm adding a new style. And I'm saying that I want the, the information to flow in a row. I want everything that's in that row to be aligned in the center. And I just want some padding around it. So once I've defined that style, coming back to here where I was rendering each row, I'm going to add a style attribute and in file style.head. So here I can reference the header. And you've seen all these curly braces that you're seeing here. It's just a way to evaluate the information. And so now once I refresh that, Save it, it's refresh automatically. I must have done something wrong, of course. F F F F one, two, three, <coughs> five. Okay. So here now things are flowing in a in a row base. But let's add some more information. Let's add a, information about where this picture was taken. And quickly, if I go back here, now I'm doing something else. So now I actually want to add not just the username, but I want to add the location just below that. And to do that, I'm actually going to enclose this another view. And I just took out the row. And here, now I've added the username. And the reason I've done that is I'm going to add the location underneath that. If I were to look at my test data, the location is under JSON object called location. But some places have locations and some don't. So I'm just going to make sure that that location actually exists. Uh, then <coughs> if it does, then I'm going to kind of extract the name attribute. If not, I'm just going to re return null. And here you can see that you can actually run functions that run uh, right in there. It's a lot easier to sort of look and see what's going on. So once I save this, now suddenly you see some places have locations, some don't. And it's very easy to get that up and running. I just don't like that they're sort of close to each other. So I'm just going to add another inline style. And I'm just going to say margin left 10. And if I uh, refresh that again, it just moves to the left. Now, final kind of like uh, icing on the cake, let's add the actual picture. So adding the picture, again, if you want to think about it, I have this sort of like header row in here. And I want to add the picture under each one of them. And the picture is available in different places. So if I go back to the data that came from a Postman, uh, And I know it's cost, so I'm going to search for. So the images, there are very many different kinds of images, and I don't know if you can actually see it clearly. But it gives an array of images, some of the low resolution, and it tells you what the size is. I'm just going to pick the lower resolution size and show that. And, I, and I'm, So what I'm going to do now here is, here so far, we've got basically something that represents the header. So because I'm going to add something below it, I'm actually going to again enclose it in another view. Because I want to actually add the, let's see what it's called. Oh, 
always forget. So uh, what I've just added is I've added another image. And in this case, I've added images, a low resolution, and the URL. And I've added the height and the source. So refreshing that, now we've got the image out there. And I'm sort of a stickler for a little bit more of uh, styling. So I want everything to kind of look like what it did in this particular page. So maybe just add a little bit of the border and just add a little bit of separation. So let's do that real quick. A few things that I'll actually show you, a few other things. So uh, to add that kind of border thing, let me just add another style. So now I'm gonna add a border and a border width into this whole content. And let's, I think you're kind of getting the hang of what I'm, and then when I say you've got this sort of, now you've got this gray border around it, but everything is sort of like hugging on each other. So let's see what we can do. And maybe a way around this is to add a separator in, in each one of these tables. And to add a separator, if you go back to list view, there's something that it makes available. You've got a style, you've got a data source, you've something that renders row. You can, actually, you can actually have things that render the footer and render the header. You can even have something that renders a separator. So here I've got this render separator function and you can return a function. And here I say I'm just gonna have an empty view and a style 20. So think of it as just another spacer. So if I refresh this, now you've kinda got like a, a ni nice view. So it was actually pretty quick. We kind of walked through uh, setting up a, a pretty decent looking app on iOS uh, in, in not too long, just using style sheets and everything in one place. And as you walk through it, it's a bit easy to understand. And if you want to do the same, I can actually take the same thing. And it's not how you would do it, but actually, actually I could actually copy the same code into this Android base and see what it looks like inside of Android. <coughs> So here we've got the simulator up there. I can reload it in JavaScript. And here we've got the same, the exact same app running in Android, uh, looking pretty, pretty nice. Uh, in, in general, what you would probably do is take a lot of the logic and separate it out into a different file and then uh, refer to it from iOS or Android. And that's typically what you would do. So um, let's go back to uh, and talk about a few other things that we want to do. But actually, before I, I, I do that, I just want to say that sometimes I've, I've, I kind of gave you static content, but there's some things that you could do a little differently. Like instead of, say, using hard-coded test data, you could li use live data. And so I'm just going to show you a few things. I've just dropped in a few, uh, a few pieces of code in here. And we're just going to walk through it real quick. So this is the live URL that you can take to access the feed. And what I'm doing is now I'm gonna change to use the live URL instead of using this hard-coded data. And the things that I've changed is I am now have, um, each component, you can we've exposed lifecycle method, and one of them is a component did mount. So component did mount is called whenever a component is sort of attached to the view. And in this case, I'm calling a function that's actually gonna make a call to get the Instagram data. So, uh, uh, React actually uses some of the HTML, X HTML request APIs by fetch, if you're familiar with them. So we can call a fetch and then when the promise is resolved, we can go ahead and check the response. And then here, check if you've got JSON data. And here, and then we are actually gonna set a data source. Eventually it's gonna go to something similar to what you saw before when you had static data. So this get data store uh, function is just gonna set the state, uh, clone the, uh, with the new data that, it, that was received. And this is one way that you can get live data. So if I were to now save this and see what it looks like on iOS. So now we have like sort of updated common that's live data. And this is one way that you could actually then, it's usually a good thing that when you're actually using React, when you're sort of testing UI to work with sort of like static data until you have like UI nice and clean and then start working with live data. So uh, just to finish off sort of like the next steps. <laughs> so I showed you XHTML, uh, uh, HTTP request. You saw how you can fetch data live. There are other ways that you can actually get data. You can work with Plus. Plus actually exposes some with open source function where you can actually 
you know, get FOSS data or uh, send data to FOSS. That's another way that you can work with data. Uh, Relay was something that was open source recently. If you recall, we actually grabbed a lot of data from Instagram, but wouldn't it be nice if each component could specify exactly what it needed so you're not sending a whole bunch of data down? So it re really gets into the concepts of how can you actually query data and get only what you want. And so in this case, how we co-located the state information or how we co-located the styles, with re Relay you can also sort of co-locate the query that you need. And then with the whole system with Relay, each component can say, I want only the username and I want only the profile picture and then maybe another component could say, oh, I also want this and then as it goes up the chain, it can make a call to get only the information it needs. So that's kind of like a, a real nice uh, thing. We didn't have time to kind of walk into that, but that's something that you could, you could use. So that's actually a very quick introduction into what React Native can give you. There's obviously a lot more than what I showed you, but this is just to give you a taste. So thank you so much and I'm open to questions.